by an argument to uh, the fence. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I agree with what Mr. Stanton summarized earlier, which was that you know we we agree on what the law is here, and I think that that is well conveyed to the court in the pleadings that have already been presented. So I'm not going to belabor the law. Based on what was testified here to here in the courtroom today, there's really one issue for the court to determine, and that's what was in the mind of Eric when he stood in front of Your Honor and entered into that guilty plea agreement. There are clear indicators from the testimony that Eric provided to the court today that he was under the impression that sentences other than the lawful sentences were eligible for the court to impose. Eric's belief that the court could impose something that went below the second degree, uh, the second degree murder minimum of a ten-year was clear. He said it over and over and over that he thought that while that was what he was pleading to, the discretion of the court remained and the court could go less than that. He also stated that throughout the course of the conversations that he had with his attorneys, different represent representations were made to him about what the offer truly would become when it came to the date for sentencing. Mr. Klaus testified that there were discussions between his brother, the state, potentially the court, wherein specific numbers were actually discussed, and that that information was conveyed to him and that he conveyed that information to Mr. Nash. What we know from both of them is that an offer was extended early in the case. That offer was rejected. According to Mr. Klaus, that offer did not change greatly, but it did change between initial offer and offer two. At the stage of offer two, we're now roughly September of 2015, negotiations were again discussed with Mr. Nash, and Eric again rejected the offer. Between September of 2015 and March of 2016, the conversations are reported to be ongoing. That was testified to by both Mr. Klaus as well as by Mr. Nash, that there was, in fact, this third meeting later in time. Mr. Klaus testified that the number 13 was represented to Eric in that window, that he would receive a 13-year sentence, most likely. If we presume that to be true, and Eric, in fact, then entered into a negotiation in this case, his position that he didn't truly understand what was going on is borne out by his reaction to the PSI writer throwing out a different number, a number that was higher than that 13. If at the time of the plea he believed he was taking a deal for one thing, no matter what that one thing was, and he later in time, the next time someone is discussing numbers with him, states a different number, <coughs> his reaction is it is not at all delayed, it is not at all inappropriate given the context of the information he was receiving. As his counsel pointed out, it was like his moment of clarity, his moment of, wait, what did I sign? Not his moment of, oh my gosh, I'm going to prison. This deal, if you believe he knowingly entered it at the time it was entered, always mandated that he would go to prison. So the idea that his reaction upon hearing these numbers from the PSI writer would have anything to do with the reality of a pending prison term, it, it's just undercut by the, the idea that he understood anything. So the only thing that reaction can be related to is the fact that he was learning different information than that which he believed to be true. This ties right into the issues related to his own educational and mental health deficits. In this particular case, we are dealing with an individual who is young, who has lifelong mental health history, who has lifelong educational issues that have been acknowledged and addressed by the school systems, and who most of the adults in his life have gone to great lengths to create different plans to accommodate his deficits. These are issues that should have been known or were known by his counsel. <coughs> when you know you're dealing with an individual who 
while competent falls in a different intellectual category or comprehensive category than the rest of your clientele, you have to make adjustments and modifications to make sure that that client is entering into decisions that are supported by sound logic and comprehension. Eric wasn't entering into this negotiation knowing and understanding what it was he was undertaking. He entered into this negotiation believing he was eligible for a sentence which isn't even lawful. He entered into this negotiation, if you believe the testimony of Mr. Klaus, instead of that position by Mr. Nausch, of believing he was coming in most likely for a 13-year sentence. And when he learned that that information was inaccurate, he immediately responded in turn. He sought assistance from his counsel. He was referred both by his own admission as well as by his prior counsel's admission to seek the assistance of others, not to you know, direct this information straight to the court or to step out and say, you know, these are the, the things you can do, but let me notify the court that you potentially need another attorney to do it. He was instead turned towards other inmates at the jail or whoever it is at the jail that that statement was directed towards and told to seek the advice elsewhere. He did not know, as he stood before this court, fully what he was pleading to. He might understand that it was a second degree murder and that that was less than a first degree murder. He might understand that there were other charges that were to be dismissed relative to the original pleading. But his position then, from the moment of that PSI interview through to today, has been consistent. And that is, I thought I was getting a different sentence than that which was told to me at the PSI interview. That moment when those numbers were discussed is the moment he became aware of what he was really looking at. And that has to be considered by the court as to what he knew as he stood before you. All right, thank you. Your Honor, um, respectfully, I think uh, in the court, in weighing the facts, the evidence before you, uh, you have to uh, come to the inescapable conclusion that the defendant is now she's an abject liar. And the way you come to that conclusion is actually going back to the date of his arrest. This may, uh, my counsel, uh, co-counsel just leaned over and whispered to me and said this is uh, almost deja vu all over again for this court. And that is, the date of his arrest, this gentleman, under the circumstances that he knew he had put into motion, stands in a second story window of a home, negotiating with armed, uniformed Metropolitan Police Department officers and SWAT units in route to be able to smoke more marijuana before he gives himself up. Then proceed via counsel in a sworn testimony before this court in a motion to suppress that statement to say that he had no idea what he was doing when he waived his rights and decided to speak to Clifford Mogg of a homicide unit. And this court reviewed the two-hour interview of Mr. Nausch being interviewed by Clifford Mogg. This court concluded, as it must have, by rejecting the sworn testimony in total of what Mr. Nash said under oath about his state of mind, about what occurred, about what was said and done, both by the uniformed officer that he encountered and discussed with, as well as Detective Bond during the interview. Has to be, because the court's ruling was to deny the motion to suppress that he, of course, the videotaped evidence was overwhelming that he knew what he was doing. He was conscious of all the facts, and yet he came into this court under oath and lied about what his state of mind was, which was completely rejected by the unequivocal video and audio evidence in that hearing. And so what do we have here again today? The exact same thing in spades. We have a person who comes in here under oath and says, I didn't have any discovery. None. 
besides an indictment in two case and a transcript of my statement. Yet the pleading says, two weeks before my entry of plea, I've been demanding to get what? The grand jury transcript. I mean, the motion by current counsel even isn't, isn't consistent with her client's own sworn testimony. Counsel says, quoting here to this court just now, that there has been a lifetime of mental health treatment and specialized plans with the school district. Where's that evidence before this court? I'm waiting for counsel to stand up and move to admit the IEP plans, to move to admit the mental health records of the defendant. Those haven't been done. There's a reason why. And the reason why was elicited by my questions of both the defendant as well as my attempt to go down that road with Mr. Klaus. The effect of those records are not to be a mitigation and explanation that the defendant, as they claim in issue number one, page seven, line 21 of the motion as a basis to ask this court that the plea is involuntary. No, in fact, his trial counsel has reviewed those and has adroitly assessed that not only are they not mitigators, that they're aggravators, that they turn out to be a basis of why the defendant shouldn't go to trial, both from a penalty pace uh, perspective as well as an attempt, the only attempt, according to Mr. Nausch's uh, statement to detectives, was to argue or claim at a jury trial self-defense or defense of others, which is now obliterated because the records show that he's paranoid and had been diagnosed repeatedly, and he was homicidal repeatedly throughout his life. So not only does it, is it rejected as a direct claim before this court, but it actually is counterproductive and evidences indeed an intelligent, voluntary entry of plea of which counsel, any counsel, would sit there and advise this defendant to engage in with full force and vigor. Not one claim articulated in their motion stands ground or it holds its own in this hearing. They have, haven't proven any. In fact, they've been all disproven. The claim of his guilty plea agreement not being signed. I think the evidence is, yes, the actual physical guilty plea was not shown to him until the day that he entered his plea. But as Mr. Nausch had no recollection of whether it occurred, and if it did occur, where physically it occurred, Occurred, but you saw Mr. Klaus say, yeah, sitting right over there in your jury box, I sat down here and reviewed the guilty plea agreement with him. Not only leading up to the guilty plea agreement, but during the canvas of the court and the actual pre-plea process that day, but even more compelling is subsequent from that. There is no evidence to, uh, related to his counsel that would have given him counsel pause to say that this was anything but a knowing and involuntary plea in this case. Claim about pressure. What's the pressure? According to the written motion of counsel, it's listed on page 8, line 1 through 5. None of those things were articulated by the defendant. Once again, the pleading is inconsistent with the defendant's own sworn testimony. They claim the pressure is, one, withholding discovery until two weeks prior to the entry of plea. We've heard no such testimony whatsoever in that regard. In fact, if you were to listen to the defendant, all the discovery was withheld from Present with a guilt written guilty plea agreement until the court went on the morning of the plea counts. Once again, Mr. Now says that's not the pressure. I ask him on three different occasions, three different ways, tell me what you mean by the quote, I felt pressure. What's the answer? The exact thing that the Nevada Supreme Court and virtually every other courts in the country flatly reject as a basis to withdraw the plea. What's that pressure? What the man said right out of his mouth. I didn't want to do that much time. That's not a basis to withdraw a guilty plea. And finally, the claim, once again by counsel, is discouraging Mr. Nows from asking questions during the canvas. Uh, I believe there has been no testimony in that regard. He says that he was told by his attorneys to say yes to everything that the court asked him, but not only does the transcript, but the jabs belies any claim that there, he was pressured whatsoever in the actual canvas by this court. 
Uh, I believe the court may recall this plea because of the nature of this case and the proceedings leading up to it, but there is nothing from the state's recollection or review both in the written transcript or the recording of this plea <coughs> that would cause this court any concern whatsoever that it was knowing and intelligently given. Once again, I ask this court to do what it had previously done by the overwhelming evidence, and that is to reject in its entirety the defendant's testimony here today and conclude that there's not only a, not only a factual, but there is no legal basis for this guilty plea being withdrawn. Any further, Mr. Yeah, yeah. All right, thank you. I'd like to thank both counsel. I reviewed the pleading in this matter and the entire history of this case. And as, as both parties know, there's a presumption here that the plea is valid. Under Stevenson, this court looked to the totality of circumstances to determine whether permitting withdrawal of the plea would be fair and just, again, under the circumstances. Further, the court also looks at whether or not the defendant entered his plea knowingly, voluntarily, intelligently. I would note that prior to the plea, we had nine court appearances. And at, any of the, at none of those court appearances, the defendant voiced to this court that at any time he felt he was being pressured by his attorneys, either regarding the September offer 2015 or the March offer. The guilty plea agreement that was signed in this matter uh, sets forth in the negotiations, and most importantly for our hearing today, the potential sentences and the rights of the defendant. As both sides should be aware, this court's canvas goes beyond the form canvas that most judges have. Uh, because of these various cases, this court takes great pains to make sure that a plea is knowingly and voluntarily entered. And that's why I've expanded my particular canvas. The defendant in this matter denies that he was aware of the potential sentence. That is belied by the record, but both by the written guilty plea agreement and by this court's own canvas, where this court, according, as identified in the transcript, specifically set forth the potential sentencing and what appears to be most important in this case is the weapons enhancement. Throughout the canvas, the defendant admitted he wanted to accept the negotiations. He admitted he understood the negotiations. He admitted that no one was forcing him to take the plea. He admitted that, he, that no one had threatened him to take the plea. And at the end, he admitted that his plea was freely and voluntarily entered. And based upon everything that was presented to the court at that time, this court made that finding for the time of the plea. And again, one of the other questions that this court goes even further, this court asked him if there were any other promises made to him outside of the plea, and he had answered in the negative. Part of this case involves the negotiations with C-306-043. I believe the charge is solved with the deadly weapon. And the court looks at the timing of the motion and the timing of these pleas. The plea in this case was March 4th. The plea in the assault with the deadly weapon case was March 10th. And I'll address why that's important later. In the plea, in, in C-306-043 identifies this case. And in the other case, Judge Tagliati did find the defendant entering that plea freely and voluntarily. In reviewing the history of this case, the court reviewed the evidentiary hearing of August 21st, 2015. And at that time, there was a claim that his statement was not freely and voluntarily made, but he did not understand the Miranda rights. And also, he claimed that he was under the effects of narcotics, which prevented him from understanding what he was saying or the plea. 
and after reviewing the entire tran the transcript and the video and hearing argument of counsel, this court made a finding that uh, Miranda was given, that the defendant knew what he was saying, and he gave a voluntary statement to the officers. And specifically in the statement, he had the wherewithal that initially he was minimizing his conduct, minimizing his criminal exposure. Three matters were brought up to justify the withdrawal of the guilty plea in this matter, and I'll address those in order. One is that it's a claim that uh, prior counsel uh, failed to properly investigate mental health issues and take those into consideration in recommending the negotiations in this matter. There's nothing before this court, or my interpretation of the evidence, that counsel failed to do that. I find the exact opposite. I would note in the guilty plea, excuse me, in the PSI, the defendant had represented to the, the writer, in both in this case and in C-306-043, that at age five he was diagnosed with bipolar, ADD. At age 12 or 14, the defendant advised the author that he had stopped taking his medication. It, it is noted that he had completed his 11th grade. I do find that the defendant, defense counsel, excuse me, defense counsel, did properly evaluate the competency issues here, did review these issues with the defendant and his mother, and looked at numerous records. There's no allegation at the time of the plea, either in this case or in the case before, I think it was Judge Tagliani, that the defendant was under any psychotropic medication that prevented him from understanding his plea. And it's quite clear from Mr. Klaus's testimony that he did not have any concerns of competency when discussing the case with his client, nor when he entered his plea. He stated that mental health issues are always a concern of his, and he takes those into consideration in all cases, which is appropriate for all defense counsels. On the issue of the failure to explain potential penalties, the court specifically finds that that's not the case. The guilty plea agreement quite clearly sets forth the potential penalties. And again, this court set forth the penalties to the defendant, which he answered he understood. And also, the defendant admitted to the court at the time of plea that he had read and understood everything contained within the guilty plea agreement, which includes the potential penalties. In the guilty plea agreement, as well as this court's canvas, Mr. Nash was advised that sentencing would strictly be up to this court. There has been no credible evidence here regarding defense counsel telling the defendant to merely parrot the word yes every time the court asks him a question at the time of his plea. Defense counsel testified today that he advised the defendant at least on, I think, say over 20 occasions regarding the weapons enhancement, as well as this court, as well as the guilty plea agreement. It's testified that there was no concerns by the attorney that the defendant did not understand the penalty enhancements. And there's testimony from counsel that on or before, on or about September 2015, discussed sentencing issues were discussed with the defendant, as well as prior to the plea in this particular case. I 
I believe perhaps that there is a, a moment of realization that now when when Mr. Nash was being interviewed by the PSA writer and was and the sense he gave was fast approaching, he believed now was the time of, if I can use the phrase, time of reckoning. And decided that perhaps it was buyer's remorse for this negotiation. The third claim is that counsel pressured him to take the deal. There's testimony that there were ongoing discussions with both the DA's office as well as with Mr. Mausch, potential negotiations. There's testimony that my attorney Cloud said there was no concerns that defense questions were unresolved. Every defendant facing a sentence feels pressure to accept negotiations because they're going to look at the potential incarceration. I did not find any testimony here, any evidence that the plea by Mr. Nash was forced by any pressure imposed upon him by counsel or this court. The next issue is regarding discovery that the defendant entered his plea without the benefit of discovery. It's testimony that discovery was provided. There was, when Mr. Klaus met with the client, they discussed the, the witnesses and no time at that, during those meetings, the defendant said, I don't know what discovery you're talking about, which would be consistent with the claim that he never received any. But the testimony is otherwise. As I mentioned before, the timing of the motion is relevant to this court's determination. The plea in this case is March 4th, and the, the filing of the defendant's motion to withdraw a plea was dated April 17th, approximately six weeks later. As the parties know, under U.S. v. Alexander, as well as U.S. v. Baker, cited in the Stevenson case, the court looks to the timing of the plea and the motion to withdraw to make a determination whether or not a defendant made a rash or hasty decision. I do not find that the defendant made a rash or hasty decision in this case. In the pre-sentence investigation report, there is no mention that the defendant advised the, the author of the report that he was ever pressured to take the deal in either case, which I reviewed the PSI in the other case as well. There was no mention of him wanting to withdraw his plea, no mention he didn't understand the negotiations in either case. Considering the totality of circumstances of the record for this court, as well as the testimony, I find that the defendant's entry of plea was freely, voluntarily, and normally entered. Therefore, the court concludes that Mr. Nash has failed to present sufficient reason to permit withdrawal of his plea. The court specifically finds Attorney Klaus's testimony to be credible. Motion denied. We'll set a sentencing next Friday, 10.30. Thank you, Your Honor. December 16th, 8.30 a.m. I apologize. When we were originally appointed on this matter, we were appointed for the limited purpose of this investigation and motion and hearing. Could you continue that appointment? Absolutely. I appreciate you staying on the case. Also, can we have a slightly lengthier time frame? I would like to file a sentencing memorandum. I would like to produce mitigation materials to the court, and that just simply can't be done on that timeline. The court is going to be dark at a portion of the end of this year. I would like to get it resolved before the court leaves. Is there a 
urge the parties to be prepared by next Friday? I, I simply can't do it. I have an appeal that I need to respond to by the end of today that only came into fruition this past Monday of this week. I have a preliminary hearing in another murder case on Tuesday. I have a hearing in Judge Levitt's courtroom on another capital case on Tuesday, and I have a writ argument calendar call on Thursday next week. I simply cannot give us the attention that it deserves and requires and come into the court and answer what I want to have sentencing. I also, as a side matter, would need to address those concerns that were raised with the PSI itself. I have never discussed those with my client. And if there are things that rise to the level of needed a correct meeting, a corrected PSI, we need to alert the court of that and allow the time for that to unfold. Right. Judge Ginsburg, <coughs> yes, sir. May I approach and file with the clerk of the court in anticipation of the sentencing the mental and medical records of the defendant now, which I believe is relevant for the sentencing purposes? Does the defense counsel have a copy yes. of this, please? All right, thank you. I'd ask that the court. It's the copyright. Yes. Okay. Making sure we're talking. Just to ask because I will be uh, referring to those to the court. They're not all that lengthy. Uh, they're not as All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.